So we're going to start on chapter two and from here on out, all the way through chapter seven, we're going to learn the terms you need to be visually literate. And today we're just going to start with the basics. And um, these terms, these concepts are going to help you speak and write more clearly and intelligently about art. So like we're all, you know, everybody looks at stuff all day long and it, it's real easy to say we like something, you know, on Facebook. You like it, you hate it, you laugh at it, you make a frowny face, whatever. Um, so it's really easy to do that, but it's more difficult to say precisely why we like or dislike something. We're gonna start with two um, paintings. One is a triptych, that's the one on the right. A triptych is a painting in which there's um, three separate paintings that make a whole painting. And, and on the left is um, a small still life. And these are both by an artist named Fernando Botero. Botero was from Mexico. He, um, he liked painting large individuals and um, a lot of his paintings were like really pleasant to look at. There'd be people at fiestas or couples or paintings of families. And then sometimes he did still lifes and when he did the still lifes like this bowl of fruit on the on the left, the 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 fruit was like large and luscious, just like the figures he painted. Um, so it's like these things, these paintings of his were really easy on the eye. But then in 2005, during the Iraq war, um, Botero, among many other people, started seeing these really horrifying images coming out of the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. And um, like originally this prison had been uh, this horrible prison that uh, was run by Saddam Hussein. Um, but then during the, um, the, the war in Iraq, the American intelligence took it over and it was a place where they um, tortured and imprisoned terrorists. And these really horrifying images um, taken by um, um, American personnel, American soldiers, of, um, of them torturing individuals uh, came out. And um, Botero was like horrified and repulsed by this. And it was so upsetting to him that he felt the need to paint these images. And, you know, our, our physical reaction is to, to look at these two sets of paintings and like the one, the fruit on the right, while well, it doesn't make us think it, you know, like, oh, that's a nice ball of fruit. And then, um, I'm sorry, the fruit on the left. And then on the right, we, we see these torture images and we're, you know, like your immediate reaction is like, I don't like that, you're horrified. But these paintings, um, they, they tell a greater truth and and they really make us think. So we have to like delve into to the whys and why nots of, of, of painting. But before we get into that, let's talk about the different kinds of painting. So people for thousands of years have tried to depict the way the natural world looks, the world around us. And some of these, are um, like more realistic than others. Um, this is a very early cave drawing in Lascaux, France, of some some men at the hunt of deers, and there's a buck right there. And then this is another painting about hunting. It's by um, Peter Bruegel the Elder, and it's hunters in the snow and we saw an earlier painting by him of those children's games. And these are some tired huntsmen coming home after a long day. Um, and so the one on the 
flat looks a little more realistic and three-dimensional than the one on the right, even though the one on the right, we still look at it and we still know what's going on in it. So, um, so again, you know, like some attempts are more realistic, um, like this Kevin Okafor, than, than this Pablo Picasso, even though we're looking at both of them and we know this is a man, we know this is a woman, although I don't know too many women, maybe one or two that look like that. I'm kidding. So visual art falls into three categories. There's representational, there's abstract, and then there's non-representational, also known as non-objective, and we'll go into those. So representational art is the art that's the, the artist is trying to make things look as much like the natural world as possible. They're portraying natural objects in recognizable form. So they're, they're really trying to make things look like they do in real life. And the more the object resembles what the eye sees, that's called realism. And then there's, there's one that, something we'll talk about that, the more it looks like a photograph, even though it might be a drawing or a painting, that's called um, photorealism. So I'm just going to show you like a few examples. This, this painting by Hans Holbein. It's of a lady with a squirrel and a starling. Like rich people used to have like squirrels and birds as pets. And this, she looks pretty real, realistic. Oops, can't even talk. And the reason why she does is because we'll learn about this in photography. He used this device. It wasn't a camera as we know a camera. But it's something called a camera obscura that would project, like you would put a, like you'd be in a dark room or a dark box, and then you'd have a tiny hole in the wall, and that would project light from the outside, and whatever, whoever, whatever stood in front of that, that hole would, would appear um, in reverse on the opposite side of the room. Um, that sounds like magic, doesn't it? We'll learn that people thought it was magic later. So he would use these, would be, he'd have his canvas and he would trace whatever projected from the other room and he'd have to trace it upside down and then he would paint it. And because he's such a skilled painter, like anybody can trace, but you have to be a really skilled painter to take what you trace and make look representational realistic looking, three-dimensional like this is. So this, this is an example of representational painting. Uh, some other representational paintings, like a really famous artist was John Constable. And John Constable, um, he was, um, he painted this painting, The Hay Wayne, in 1821. And, and um, like, uh, couple of centuries before landscape paintings, they were really totally highly valued in Europe. But by the time Constable came around, people just thought like this was the lowest form of art. Like they preferred portrait painting and still lives, but portrait paintings the most. And most landscape paintings are really small. And Constables made these really large landscape paintings. What he would do is he would go, he would go outside and he would do a little tiny sketch, like a little oil painting sketch, or sometimes he'd do watercolor sketches. And then he would come back to the studio and he would paint these, these giant canvases. Um, he was like in England, he wasn't respected very much, but, um, but in France, they just, they totally, they loved his work. Um, he, I saw some paintings of clouds he did, like one of the very few times I traveled overseas. I was in London and they're just amazingly beautiful. And if you've ever tried to paint a cloud and make it look realistic, it's not an easy thing to do. Mine always look like cupcakes. Here's, there's a painting of a, of a beach that he did. He was really interested in, weather conditions and he grew up on a farm. His dad owned a farm 
and his paintings, you know, again, we talk about things not being in a vacuum. His paintings, they, they were painted during the Industrial Revolution where everything starts to get polluted and smoky and there's all this crap running in streams and um, cities like people, like all farmers, rural people, we're all moving to the cities to work in these big factories and their cities are dirty, the water's dirty, you can't even drink it. People are, poor people are drinking gin and the rich people are drinking port and beer and stuff. And, um, and during this time period, like the poor really suffer. The middle class and the rich are getting more prosperous and, there's like no child labor laws, few safety regulations. It's um, it's pretty awful. And so his paintings, they they mourn the loss of a former time. They they mourn the loss of clear skies and this lost Eden. Um, and it, he he just he just wishes it was a more simpler time and. And we even ourselves even know during this time of coronavirus, by the time you hear this, I hope it's over, but that because people aren't driving so much, even though we're suffering, people are sick, people are dying, we're isolated at home, you better be isolated at home. Um, but the skies are getting clear and like, I don't remember a day in the past two months that the skies have smelled bad or felt polluted. Um, so he he mourns for that for that time. Another um, representational painting is is by a, this is a man's name, Anne Louis Gerardo de Rossi Trisson, and this is a I have the best French accent you ever heard, right? Ha! This is a portrait of Jean Baptiste Ballet, and he was a deputy for Saint Dominique. And so he was a native of Senegal. And when he was a little bitty, bitty baby boy, two years old, he was kidnapped and he was placed on a slave ship headed for Saint Dominique. It was like over time, he managed to save enough money to purchase his own freedom. He's a really totally brilliant man. And um, in and, and the, like so San Dominique this is Haiti now. He um he and other enslaved Africans, they were inspired by the American Revolution, the French Revolution, they began to fight for Haitian independence in seventeen ninety one. And in seventeen ninety three, Belay became the first man of African descent to be named a deputy for the French National Convention. In a, like the following year, he spoke at this debate and he, he spoke, he, he like spoke so impassioned about the, the wrongs of slavery and how it should be like abolished. It was so convincing and so impassioned that, um, that it led to an unanimous decision to abolish slavery at the time. But then five years later, Napoleon Bonaparte, he revoked this. And he, um, in, in following this, like Belay lost this position as a deputy. And then he, um, he had to return to Summit Dominique where he was an, um, an officer with the gendarmes, uh, which are um, like these heavy cavalry men, and then and then um, and then later he was arrested on the orders of Napoleon Bonaparte and sent back to France, where he died in in prison. And so he's like in this. This is like typical of the portraits of the of the time and you know you had to be either really rich or somebody special to get your portrait painted and here he is he's he's leaning against a, a bust of um this Guillaume 
Thomas Ranal, he was a philosopher who strongly supported the abolition of slavery. And here, Belay is, is looking out to the sky for the hopes of a better tomorrow. Now, this kind of painting that is representational, but it was also part of an artistic movement known as the Romantic Movement, which um, was lower like a group of writers, artists, architects, playwrights, and it's kind of hard to categorize this, but they produced these works that were fraught with emotion. They, they, they de dealt with the overwhelming power of nature, man-made disasters, and this, in this instance, the man-made disaster of slavery. And they, they, they wanted their paintings to be full of these strong emotions because they felt like when you were emotional, you were a mo more authentic human being. So here's a contemporary artist, Omar Victor Diop, who um, does did a, has done a series of photographs that um, from the diaspora. That the diaspora is a forcible removal of Africans who were sent to the Americas, to the Caribbean, to to Europe as slaves, and um, and he depicts these uh, like Africans who played a famous role in history, but he kind of does them with a contemporary bent where, so he uses himself as a model and he, um, he'll he make reference to history, sports and painting. So like this one refers back to that painting of Belay, obviously. And for the most part, all photographs are representational art, although there are some exceptions, but most of them are representational because they depict the world of real natural appearances. So the next kind of art we're going to talk about is abstract art. So when an artist abstracts an image or figures or objects that are depicted in a stylized, exaggerated, or simplified way, and you're able to look at these paintings and still recognize what's in them, but they don't look realistic. So we're going to look at a couple of them. So this is by a famous Zen Buddhist master, Japanese, and he studied Chinese Tao master techniques. This is Seshu Toyo. And um, so these, these Tao, Taoism, it, it, they're both, there's one spelled with a T, one spelled with a D, but they're pronounced with a D. Um, this is a philosophy that stresses humanity's relationship with nature and the dual forces of opposites, yin and yang. So when the artist paints these, it's a spiritual or sacred practice. It's a, like it, it, it helps them. They're meditating on nature, but it's, they're, they're also, these were given to people and they would have these in their home and they would meditate on nature in the sanctity of their home or a temple. And this particular style of painting is called haboku. And so haboku is like the artist would splash paint on the, the, the rice paper generally or silk and then look at it and then from it would create this abstract landscape or other scene. And so this is abstract, not realistic looking, but we still see mountains in the distance, a tree on a small mound of land, weeds growing, um, and the sky in the distance. So we still recognize what it is, but it's not realistic or representational. There's this is another painting by him. Um, Here's another example of something that's abstract. This is a figure known as Chakmul, it's in Chitsen Itza in the Yucatan. And um, it's like Chakmul or Chakmul is like translates to Paul swift like thunder. And it was, of course, mistakenly named by a French archeologist. And these are, a lot of times they're 
are found at um, temple sites uh, in the courtyard at the base of the temple. They were used for placing sacrifices of, of food or flowers or your head, for example, or maybe your heart that had gotten cut out. And uh, I'm not going to pronounce this right, but they're associated with Tlaloc, the Mesoamerican rain god. And so, this one doesn't, but sometimes they'll have carvings of fish and seashells and other marine life at the base. And uh, these are found at Mayan and Aztec sites. Um, they speculate that they're these warriors who carry offerings to the gods. So this is this is abstract because we recognize this as a person and perhaps as a man, but it's not a specific person. Like it's a person and not Uncle Joe. Um, it's everything like these are leg wrappings on these sandals, but they're not specific. You know, like they're just like, here, I'm going to draw some leg wrappings without looking at them. Um, so it's it's really abstracted. The facial features have been really simplified. The hands, the body is like really simplified. So it doesn't represent a specific person. And a lot of times abstract art is there's a generalization of features like like this could be any person as opposed to a specific I can't even say that like specific features of like that's what my eye looks like that's what my nose look like that's what your hair looks like it's not specific it's generalized um, and this is one of those instances with the roles of the artists the artists give form to immaterial ideas and feelings such as hidden and universal truths, spiritual forces, and personal feelings. So in the, in the Mayan religion, sacrifice was really Im important and bloodletting was really important because the blood nourished the gods and it was, and the sacrifice was linked to creation and rebirth, like as it could either relate to the to the harvest or to the advent of a new year or the ascension of a new king. And a lot of times children were kidnapped from other towns in these rebirth rituals sometimes. Um, in other cases, people that were defeated in, in battle were, were placed on uh, like these opposing um, teams and um, the, they would have to battle it out for their lives on a court is sort of like kind of like basketball kind of like soccer um and they so they battle it out and then the losers would be either decapitated or tied up in a ball and then thrown down the court or temple stairs and even the mayan word for ball quip i'm sure i said that right q u i p it relates to these rituals and it translates to sap or to blood. Um, defeated kings were like subjects of sacrifice. And again, they were like decapitated, disemboweled, their heart was cut out. Um, sometimes people were beaten to death with thorny branches. Really, really great. So here's some more um, abstract art where we recognize these as canoes, but they're not a specific canoe. These are people, but but we can't point out who these individuals are because they're all their features are all pretty much the same. Maybe we could tell by what they're wearing, but they're still pretty abstract. There's a, I love this artist Rufina Tamayo, also from Mexico, uh, Dos Perros, and his work like these are dogs with a bowl of bones, and they're very very abstract and decorative um like at the beginning of our folder this week we have a carrie james marshall and even though like parts of his paintings are realistic he like abstracts things like people's uh, facial features 
or he'll he'll like on these he's like doing these it's supposed to be like 1960s towns and you would always like see like tv shows you'd always see like these white people that live in these really beautiful bucolic neighborhoods and then he has um these african americans living in what on the surface looks like a nice place but it's totally blighted and has all sorts of problems and here's somebody that's just been shot and killed and these kids are running not because they're having fun but because somebody's somebody's like threatening them um so then this is a gauguin and even though parts of this look realistic then the way he chops up the landscape almost like it's a jigsaw puzzle makes it and the way he draws these plants they're really exaggerated makes it more abstract so finally the last kind of art we're going to talk about is non-representational or non-objective and it makes no obvious reference to the natural world as no recognizable subject matter so when we study Malevich and suprematism the square on square that's non-representational so sometimes non-representational art deals with formal issues such as things like line and color and shape and pattern and texture it might deal with emotional or expressive content um, shown through the way the artist has painted it or the use of colors or it might deal with the inherent qualities of a particular material or medium and we're going to find out what i mean by that in just a minute um, then non-representational art there are no figures no objects this color shape line textures patterns um, so here's an artist helen frankenthaler she this is going to be confusing because the group of artists that she belonged to were the abstract expressionists some of these artists in this group they're from new york did non-representational work and some did abstract work so just kind of like forget about that for a minute so the abs like these abstract expressionists their work emphasize like dynamic gesture that means like when they're painting they're a lot of times painting on these really large canvases they're climbing up and down ladders they're like Helen Frankenthaler would get on the ground and like pour paint and then like push it around with their hands and Jackson Pollock's another one of them where he put a giant canvas on the ground and then walk around and throw paint on it so they're moving a lot when they're painting these and then the other thing is a lot of times although not all of them will have these large open fields of color that are that like like they're almost meditative that you're supposed to focus on those colors so when uh helen frankenthaler when we talked about this inherent qualities of a particular material or medium so what she would do is back then most people would take their canvas and they would prime it they would put gesso on it to seal it because canvas is cloth and you put paint on it without sealing it the paint's gonna run through it so most artists wanted you know like that sealed surface but the way she worked is she worked on raw canvas that hadn't been sealed and she would sometimes use oil sometimes use acrylic and then thin it down a whole lot and like pour and push it on to the um, canvas and then then take another darker color like this and like drop it into it and see how it bleeds she wants to see what happens to this material when you don't let it dry and you put it next to each other or like she would like add in these other edges of color and then they would bleed a little bit into the blue and she just she just liked to see what happened when you worked with the material that way she also liked to see what happened when what happened would happen if you put this color next to this color and so when she'd start out doing these she wouldn't have any object or figure or anything in mind and she would just start painting and then when she got through with them 
then she would look at them and name them and she named this bay because then she looks at it and she goes, oh, well, I guess that could be water and that could be land and that could be the road. But that was not her intention. Her intention when she made it was to make it totally non-representational. Another artist uh, who was young and sadly um, died fairly young, um, I believe in her 30s, was Eva Hess. Um, she would make these non-representational things that were three-dimensional. She might call it legs of a walking ball later on, but she would, when she would make them, she would just make them. So, she, so this is like a flat surface, and then she adds these three-dimensional weird things on top of it, sometimes painting them, sometimes leaving them their natural color. She worked with felt a lot. Um, this is made out of paint, cord, cord wrap metal, and masonite. Um, so she worked with all sorts of materials. So these are, you know, later on she might give them a name that's representational, but once you make them, they're intended to be non-representational, just dealing with form and color and shape and pattern. There's another one, Robert Motherwell, same thing. He just, he makes these puts down the orange, puts down some white, and then quickly paints this black kind of splattering it on top. And then he looks at it, so it's not representational. And then he looks at it and he goes, oh, it looks like somebody dancing. I'll name it dance. So don't let the titles of them confuse you. It's the, the paintings themselves. So we, we look at them, we don't, we don't see any recognizable forms. Sonia Delaney, we talked about her earlier. Her work is non-representational, both the clothing and the paintings because they're shapes and colors and patterns. Um, another kind of non, you know, like we think of non-objective or non-representational work as being a, a fairly new concept. A lot of people think, oh, well, that came along with Picasso, but really it's it's been around for a really long time in um, in Rajasthan. There's, this is a tradition that's been going on since the fifth or sixth century. These are uh, tantric Hindu paintings. And there, is this a mystical form of, of, of Hinduism? Um, it's like they would paint these on recycled paper. So, so they would, you could see like somebody had written on this paper and they soaked it, it's heavy duty paper. They soaked it in, in water and got out as much of that as they could. And then um, they, they use these in meditation, um, like they, to awaken these heightened states of consciousness and to help you call upon the gods. Like these are portals that, like when you meditate on them, it takes you to this other world of the gods. And the shapes in the paintings, like I don't know what they are, but I, I've read that they represent particular gods or they, um, they, but like if you belong to this religious practice and culture, you would know what, what these mean. And these paintings were not meant to be sold. They're still not meant to be sold. They're, they were given to, families or friends so that they too could meditate on them and the practice of painting these was passed down from one generation to another. So if you practice tantric Hinduism, like I said before, you you could look at these and you would know what the symbolism in them represented. And the and the ability to read the symbolism and visual images it's um or, or the practice of making symbolism and visual images is called iconography so that deals with the interpretation of the symbolism of visual images and we we look at these two symbols and like if you were from the fifth or sixth century you would look at this and you go i i give up i don't know what this means but we know this is mcdonald's we know this is for the rockets um, so we're going to look at a painting 
that was painted by Jean Vanek. And, um, and we're gonna we're gonna break down the symbolism in it. So this is called the Marriage of the Arnolfini, and this is painted in 1434. And the the Arnolfini is like rich. I think they're I'm gonna say they're wool merchants. This is a rich family, and um, and in this painting, um, it, it celebrates their marriage. So we're gonna look at all the things in it and try to figure out what they mean. So there's there's this little dog in the painting. And when we think of dogs, what do we think of? Well, like one thing, like when you come home and like who greets you at the door and is so happy to see you like no matter what, it, it's your dog. So dogs represent fidelity and loyalty but there was another reason why people had dogs back then. So rich people would have them. These are, they developed breeds that were small, they called lap dogs, because people were infested with fleas and lice and like all sorts of stuff. So they kind of got it into their head. Well, like if I have fleas and I have a dog, the fleas are gonna jump on the dog. But we know better, we know the fleas jump off the dog and on to us. So that's what that dog represents. Then when we, uh, this guy has his hand raised and when do you raise your hand? Well, in class you raise your hand because you want me to call on you, but almost nobody raises their hands anymore. Um, they, you raise your hand when you're taking a, a pledge or a sacred oath. So he's like, he's pledging himself to her. You look at her and you're like, you probably think, uh-oh, shotgun wedding. But in reality, she's not pregnant. This was a style. This was a, a, a style of dress that um, indicated that the woman you were marrying was fertile and could have children. And the style of dress was copied by, you know, like there was some famous, like, beautiful princess or queen or something and everyone's like i want to look like her so they sort of adopting this fake pregnant look um then like when when we see the man and the woman he's on the left near the open windows now what could that symbolize well his world is out there he works outside her side is symbolized by the bed her side is like she is responsible for having children. She's responsible for taking care of the home. Their shoes are taken off because they're in a sacred place. This um, this is amber, and this is a amber is like ancient. It's been around, you know, like it's fossilized and it's been around sap with sometimes little bugs and stuff in it, and it's lasted through the centuries and the man would give this to his wife because that would mean like how long lasting their life was. I'm just gonna go over a couple of more of these symbolism. The this mirror, I like how I say it, I'm from Texas. It's got the stages of the cross on it. And the mirror represents two things. There's actually three in this case. The mirror is the all seeing eye of God who sees everything. This is a concave mirror, not a flat mirror. That represents that Jean Van Eyck is such a talented artist that he can actually paint the way things are distorted in a convex mirror, convex concave, convex mirror. And then it also represents, like if you look, here's the couple, who's that? Who comes to your wedding, especially if you're having a civil ceremony, witnesses those are the witnesses and one of those witnesses was Jean Van Eyck because it says on the wall Jean Van Eyck was here the candelabra um, and the lit candles that represents the light of God the the whisk broom the woman's going to keep the house clean and we can't see it there's a little figure on the edge of the bed which is princess princess Saint Margarita, not the drinking kind, but the one 
who is a saint of childbirth and fertility. Um, there's some other things. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the last part of the chapter because I'm running kind of long here. So people, a lot of times people will go like, oh yeah, the first abstract artist was Picasso or the first abstract artist was Vasily Kandinsky or you know all these other people. But that's not true because people have been making abstract art forever like all over the world like um like in the middle east in africa in asia in the americas in europe people have been making abstract art a really long time and we're just gonna focus on the ancient people of the greek islands where they produce like extremely abstract sculptures that we know these represent people, but they don't look like specific individuals. They're, they're more simplified or generalized. Um, but the Greeks, they start out abstract, but they gradually become more and more and more representational. They, they were exposed to the art of the Egyptians they learned the art of sculpture from them, and the the um, sculptures of this period. This is um, like I think this one was probably I forget what year, but I want to say like in the 740 BC or something. Um, I could be wrong, but it their work gets a little more realistic but still very abstract and you see they copy the stance of the Egyptians and the way the hands are held of the Egyptians and even kind of like the hair of the Egyptians. The Egyptians are a little more modest. They put some clothes on. The Greeks they're like gods are perfect. They need to show their body and athletes and soldiers they're they're they have the perfect bodies so let's walk around with no clothes on so then the sculptures get more and more realistic and they used to they used to paint their sculptures and they would put like these stone eyes in them so they they looked even more representational and then like so we go to i think this is like i think i said it was like 700 or 600 and 40 BC, it's still abstract. We get to 480 AD and it becomes like more and more realistic. Um, but like this guy, when he was made, he had eyes, he had, he had his arms and legs. He was probably damaged in some battle or when somebody took over. But um, the Greeks believe gods took human form and um, so they started making more representational, but when things look too realistic, it starts to creep out people. And when they're too realistic, this is known as the uncanny valley effect, too real creeps out people like, like these automatons or robots that look like real people, creepy. You ever see that show Humans? Love that show. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, so then they even moved beyond totally representational to where they became hyper realistic and exaggerated in terms of aesthetic or movement or dramatic quality. So like in this one, 480 AD, we, um, we look at this like 320 BC. This is like, I think this is supposed to say BC. Um, 320 BC, they're just like, they're like movie stars. They're so like hyper muscular and they're full of movement and they're very dramatic. Um, so the Greeks, they move from totally abstract to a little less abstract to more realistic, to like completely realistic and to exaggeratingly realistic. So Picasso's work was very representational. He was a child prodigy. He painted these when he was 15 years old. And over time, 
His work got a little more expressive, but it's still pretty much representational, um, although it's getting a little more abstract. Um, but then these three really important events happened to him. He, um, his friend Henri Matisse started collecting these sculptures from Africa and, um, and, and Picasso saw them and he was like, these are probably from someplace colonized by France, I'm sure, like Ghana or something. No, not Ghana, uh, like Ivory Coast, sorry. Um, so he saw these, he's like, wow, I really love those. I'm gonna start collecting them. And then he's Spanish, he lives in France, he travels to Spain and he sees these uh, ancient sculptures of the Iberian people. Those were the natives to Spain before the Visigoths and Germanic tribes in the, like, in, in the Normans came to Spain. Um, so he sees those and then he goes to this, this museum called the Musée de Ethnographie de Trocadoro, which is the Ethnographic Museum in Paris. This is a museum where um, they show like sculpture and art from like um, Native Americans, from Africa, Oceanic people, ancient people. Uh, and this museum is just like chalk. It's not like a museum you get, look at her. That's uh, Josephine Baker. She's like actually in the container where this, um, costume is and she's standing right next to it, she's laying in on it. You can't do that now. They'd knock you down. Or like you could go up, you could touch the sculptures. The museum was really um like full of rotting wood. It smelled really nasty. Picasso said of his first visit, the smell of dampness and rot struck in my throat. It depressed me so much I wanted to get out fast. But he stayed and he looked and he saw masks from all over the world. This is a, this is a figure, Iberian figure. This is a Northwestern um, Native American mask. And this is a, a mask of the, of the Dan people. Um, and what impressed him the most were the African mask and sculptures. And he's gonna say something that sounds like a white guy in a colonizing nation, but let's just hear what he says anyway. He says, all these objects that people have created with a sacred magical purpose to serve as intermediaries between them and unknown hostile forces surrounding them, attempting to overcome their fears by giving them color and form. And then I understood what painting really meant. It's not an aesthetic process, it's a form of magic. So he, like these these masks were you know this is a used in a funeral um but they're used in these rituals and um and he sees the magic of art that it's not just something that's that's decorated decorative pardon me and so he starts looking at the way they're done and it starts changing because they're very abstract it starts changing the way he makes his art. So before he went to the Chocadoro, Picasso started doing these sketches for Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. And the, here's a sketch. And it was in response to his frenemy, Henri Matisse's um, Joy of Life painting. And the Joy of Life, he uses beautiful colors and there's all these nude people laying around and dancing and frolicking and just really enjoying themselves in the sun. It's a, you know, happy, it's not offensive, but Picasso wants to do a brothel and make it like people, women with their, all their business showing. And so he he's, he's wants to do something that's not pretty and that's, that's uh, kind of violent a little bit in nature. So in his original sketch, he's got like a, a medical student and a sailor and they're in this brothel and these women are hanging around with no clothes on. And then he, you know, he goes to the truck of the world and he gets more and more influenced by the abstract art. 
and he does hundreds of drawings in preparation for this and they get more and more abstract and he gets rid of the doctor and he gets rid of the sailor and he ends up painting this, this rather large painting of these these women in um in this brothel and it's a painting that in the western world nobody's done anything like this before where he's like fracturing them he's giving them mask he's um everything's like jagged like broken glass and as he brought his friends over to see it and one of them says your painting makes one feel as if you're trying to make us eat cotton waste soaked um, sorry eat cotton waste and wash it down with kerosene in other words they hated it they called it the death of painting somebody made a joke that he was gonna like they were gonna come in there it's not a funny joke they're gonna come in there and they're gonna find him hung, as, that he's hung himself behind this painting and he was like so kind of humiliated that he rolled the painting up and he didn't show it for for 10 years so we're gonna try to you know like look at this and again think about first of all it's abstract we recognize women we recognize the fruit um, but we're going to talk about like what's going on here and what the influences are so the influences are many this figure comes from matisse's joy of life look he just he just completely plagiarized it here's an iberian sculpture he's kind of like copies the facial features on some of these women that are close to that and close this is a early like the early roman people were the etruscans he copies those facial features he he adopts the pose of this egyptian statue and he um places these these dan mask on on the women and he wanted the women he wanted them to look not like nudes but naked where they're confronting you and like you know he used to go to this brothel and he was, he was always afraid he was going to get syphilis so he was scared in a way of these women so he made them look like really really scary so that's one thing that's going on and then something else is going on is um it's the way he's depicting space so this is typically this is a Sophonisa Anguissola painting typically a foreground middle ground background and so it looks like you're looking out a window to the world where it's real three-dimensional and he doesn't care about that he flattens out there's really no background the background is right in the foreground and there's only you know like everything's just like smashed up a piece of against the glass instead of like opening out into space so he doesn't he doesn't really care about sh um, shading properly or depicting the light sources he just like slaps on this paint and in almost like a violent sort of way it's very expressive the way he's painting it um he wants these women to be confrontational and make you uncomfortable um and so they're staring straight at you with their with their naked bodies he um here's the nude she's being dimmer mirror and they're being confrontational they're being naked um and so he's like really appropriating borrowing the abstraction that he had seen from other cultures in particular african culture and then his painting uh, becomes super influential to other artists um it's like he from there he develops he and uh, a friend of george brock developed cubism and from like the the cubist influence the futurists see how they're chopping things up and the cuba futurists and the uh, um suprematism Italian futurism, like, um, and it influences all these different kinds of movements. And where does that lead us to? Our little Malievich.
So my friends, that's the end of a rather long chapter. Talk to you later. Goodbye.